competition law continues to be an old uh, Think House favourite uh, and in this session we'll be looking at two elements in particular, e-commerce and a new UK cartel offence. Samuel Baton, one of our specialists in competition law, gives us the lowdown. Well, thank you for coming along today, Sam. Uh, I'm used in European terms to be talking about the single market in relation to uh, goods and services, but of course I understand now we're looking at a digital single market. But I've also heard about this um, uh, commission inquiry. Can you tell me about this e-commerce inquiry? Yeah, sure. The, uh, the e-commerce sector inquiry, what that really stems from is the commission has the power where it has concerns regarding the distortion of competition to, to actually launch a sector inquiry. What that means is it can take into account factors such as pricing rigidity, uh, level of trade between EU member states. It doesn't need the full evidence required to launch an investigation into a company, but it, where it has concerns about levels of competition, it can launch a sector inquiry. That's exactly what it's done in terms of e-commerce. And the reason for that underlying that sector inquiry is with e-commerce, what we see is just an explosion of the use of the internet. You know, consumers now buy online so frequently. There was a recent report that was issued by the Commission which said actually you know, one in two consumers in the EU are buying services, goods and services online now. However, what we are finding is that only 15% of those consumers are purchasing outside of their own member state, which suggests there is some reason behind that. Now that may be cultural reasons, but what the Commission really wants to get into is are there underlying reasons that perhaps companies have created whereby there is a restriction upon cross-border e-commerce? And that is really what the e-commerce sector inquiry is looking to establish. I understand there's something significant about the timing of the inquiry as well, is that right? Yeah, very much so. The timing of the inquiry it really links in with the launch by the Commission of the Digital Single Market Strategy. And what the Digital Single Market Strategy seeks to do is to really open up the digital space within Europe. So where for physical goods and services, the idea of a single European market is very, very well established. Within the digital space, the concern is that there currently are 28 separate member states which have their own markets. And the idea of the Digital Single Market Strategy is to really break down those barriers between member states. So you open up a truly cross-border EU-wide market for digital goods and services. And in terms of the sector inquiry, that ties in because that is the Commission then seeking to use competition law as a tool to achieve that outcome, so as to ensure you have you know, a robust and competitive digital single market across the entirety of Europe. And has the Commission identified any key competition concerns at this stage? Well, at this stage, the Commission is wading through thousands of responses from companies in relation to the questionnaires that the Commission has been issuing on this. However, at the time of the launch of the e-commerce sector inquiry, the Commission did identify two quite large concerns it had. The first in relation to so-called geo-blocking, and geo-blocking occurs where, for example, um, a company has a distributor in another member state, so if I'm looking to buy, perhaps, I've been on holiday to Italy, I've seen some lovely shirts in Rome, I arrive back into to Birmingham or to London, and I go on the internet to try and buy from that distributor in Rome. And what I find is I'm routed back to the UK distributor, so I'm unable to actually make that purchase. I can't make that connection via the internet to that Italian store. So that's an example of geo-blocking. Another concern is in relation to pricing restrictions, and that is you know, a perennial a bugbear of competition authorities, you know, resale price maintenance, keeping prices at a certain level, and using those to restrict competition. So the, the sector inquiry at the moment is very much squarely focusing upon distribution arrangements and the sorts of restrictions agreed between suppliers and distributors and how those may affect e-commerce. So with the Commission doing the driving in this regard, does, does that mean that the national competition authorities are taking a bit of a backseat on all this? Uh, no, uh, sadly not. What we're seeing is that national competition authorities have always tended to take enforcement action against the sorts of restrictions between distributors and suppliers that the Commission is currently looking at. So we still have national competition authorities very much undertaking their own cases and looking to apply both national and EU law as it currently stands. So for example, we have seen uh, in Germany, the German Competition Authority has recently concluded a case into the ASICS distribution system. And what the authority held there was, in terms of e-commerce, the authority identified restrictions imposed upon distributors from using ASICS keywords for online advertising. They also found that ASICs had prevented certain distributors from using price comparison websites, again, for selling via the internet. 
And what the German Competition Authority uh, held as a conclusion of its investigation was that you know, these sorts of restrictions actually you know, do infringe competition. They do infringe Article 101 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. We've also seen um, a settlement with Adidas. Adidas uh, settled with the German Competition Authority. There were concerns raised about certain clauses in its distribution system. Those have been amended by the company. The French Competition Authority has also recently concluded an investigation into Adidas, uh, working closely with the German Competition Authority in that respect. And in the UK, we have a current investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority into concerns regarding uh, internet advertising prices. So the idea that manufacturers prevent distributors advertising online below a certain price. Um, that is an area which uh, reads into resale price maintenance, concerns about maintaining pricing levels, internet restrictions. So again, we'll wait and see what happens in terms of the context of that investigation. So what does all this mean for companies? Well, for companies, I think it means they need to tread very, very carefully because at the moment e-commerce is you know, squarely under the spotlight in terms of competition or compliance. So that means if companies are looking to impose restrictions upon distributors, they need to think very carefully about what those mean in practice. So what we see in terms of competition law is it's very much a case of substance rather than form. So we have recent case law whereby uh, a company which is, has a de facto ban on selling online by virtue of a requirement to have a pharmacist present at all times. You know, that doesn't say you can't sell on the internet, but what that clause means by its operation is that a distributor cannot sell on the internet. And that has been confirmed by the Court of Justice in those circumstances to be an object restriction under Article 101. And those sorts of restrictions are the sorts of restrictions where it's very easy for a competition authority to craft a case on an object restriction and therefore the compliance risk is much higher for a company. So while it might be quite tempting to seek to have you know, a quick fix, to perhaps you know, ban a distributor from selling online or banning them from advertising certain prices online, these are things that need to be considered very, very carefully. And I think the real question is, can you achieve that outcome you're seeking via a different means? So can you actually use the existing legal framework? Can you work within that to get to where you'd like to be, rather than trying to shortcut it and giving rise to a whole range of compliance risks by doing so? So what can we expect next in relation to uh, e-commerce and EU competition law? So I think next for e-commerce, we have the sector inquiry. That will be wrapping up. We had a recent speech, uh, Margaret Vestea, the Commissioner for Competition. She indicated that the Commission was seeking to put out before Easter a uh, position paper on geo-blocking, so that would be one to read with interest. We then have the final report of the sector inquiry expected first quarter of 2017. And I think given how important this is in terms of priority for the Commission, we are likely to see those timescales being respected insofar as they can be. So we have the sector inquiry. We also have the possibility of infringement decisions coming out of that. We've seen in previous sector inquiries, for example in pharma, we saw three infringement cases brought following that. We may well see the same at both the European Commission level, but also don't forget national competition authorities are active in this space as well. So it'll be interesting to see the extent to which those develop and I think potentially expand upon the sorts of restrictions which will be caught by competition law in that e-commerce sector. Uh, away from Europe for a bit, I understand there's been some quite scary stuff coming out of the UK in relation to criminal enforcement. Very much so. I mean, where we were uh, back in 2003, we saw the introduction of the criminal cartel offence in the UK. And the criminal cartel offence, that is very much intended to operate in, to complement the existing civil regime. And what the, the criminal cartel offence does, it very much places individuals' liability at the centre of compliance. So if an individual is found guilty on indictment of the criminal cartel offence, they would face up to five years in prison and or an unlimited fine. So this is a, you know, a very, very serious sanction which faces individuals in terms of their activities in the UK. However, what we've seen to date is a somewhat limited success record by the Office of Fair Trading and its predecessor, the Competition and Markets Authority. So what we saw, some had just gone, was a trial before Southwark Crown Court of two individuals accused of engaging in a criminal cartel offence. That trial, it was a three-week trial, and the trial focused primarily upon the issue of dishonesty. And the reason for that was because under what I will call the, the old criminal cartel offence, what had to be proven by the prosecution was 
there was dishonesty in terms of the arrangements that were entered into between these competitors. And the arrangements we're thinking about here are you know, the very worst of the worst in terms of competition or infringement. So we're thinking you know, bid rigging, market sharing, price fixing between competitors. But a key component of that was proving to the criminal standard this question of dishonesty. Was the defendant dishonest in their conduct? That has proven very difficult. The trial after three weeks, uh, the jury found the two individuals to be not guilty. It proven not possible for the prosecution to actually establish dishonesty in those circumstances. So what we now have as of April 1st, 2014, have a new criminal cartel offence. And this new offence is brought in purposely to make it easier to bring prosecutions. And the way that works is dishonesty is no longer required to be proven under the new cartel offence. So dishonesty goes out of the picture and instead it is for the defence to advance certain limited defences and exclusions in relation to that offence. So the burden is much more heavily upon the defence to evidence that actually this is either capable of exclusion or it's capable of being defended. It's no longer for the prosecution to overcome this you know, quite substantial hurdle of proving dishonesty in those cases. So it's now much more likely then that people involved in uh, anti-competitive behaviour could go to prison? I think that is very, very much the case. We have seen recently the Competition and Markets Authority has been issuing a number of statements saying that they are actively looking to prosecute cartel offences in the UK. They have invested in terms of their cartel enforcement structure. They have people on board, for example, at Digital Forensics. So they are you know, very much tooled up to go after these cases. They have the expertise on board to go after these cases. It is a priority for them to go after these types of cases. We also heard in the, the trial that I mentioned in Southwark Crown Court, the sentencing judge said, this is the sort of case whereby if individuals are found guilty of this offence, it's so serious that they should be expecting prison sentences. And the evidential burden on the side of the prosecuting authority as well, by the sounds of it. The evidential burden being on the authority to actually bring that case in the first instance, mm -hmm. but then it being upon the defendants to actually evidence that, you know, with dishonesty no longer needing to be proven by a prosecution, that they are capable of defending this themselves, that they can advance a defence or proving exclusion applies to their conduct. So if you were in-house counsel, what would you be flagging to your senior management in your organisation now? I think in this current climate, more so than ever, with you know, ever-growing fines being imposed upon companies and now also a new cartel offence in the UK which is purposely designed to make it easier to bring prosecutions. This needs to be front and centre before board so they are aware of this and they can ensure they have appropriate compliance measures in place. You know, in addition to the cartel offence, I, I kind of focused on that mainly, but there is also the possibility of director disqualification. So director disqualification for up to 15 years, as well as if an individual is found guilty under the criminal cartel offence, it is possible for individuals' assets to be seized under the Proceeds of Crime Act. So these are really serious sanctions against individuals with an enforcement regime that's very much ramping up to make individual liability you know, very much the flavour of the day. So I think this is, if I was a general counsel, I would definitely make sure this is going to the board and it's a top-down approach to compliance. Uh, some very good advice there, Sam. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.